Hello, I'm Bishop Peggy Johnson from the Peninsula Delaware Conference, and I want to welcome you to the virtual Confirmation Rally 2021. I bid you grace and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm so excited that you're involved in Confirmation class. This is a time for you personally to think about your faith, to think about the love of Christ, to learn more about your church, and then make a decision for Christ yourself. I hope that every one of you will decide to accept Christ as your Savior, that you will live for God, Jesus will forgive your sins, and promise you life everlasting. That's the most exciting adventure anyone can be a part of. So God bless you, and I hope you will learn a lot today at this virtual Confirmation Rally. Hello Confirmants, my name is Rob Townsend, and I serve our annual conference as the Director of Connectional Ministries. Today we're talking about freedom, freedom in Christ, a freedom that we have in our country, and what it means to live with that freedom, and how you express it. We're going to talk a little bit about the Wesleys, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, we consider to be the founders of our Methodist movement, and we're going to talk a little bit today about Charles Wesley. Now, Charles Wesley was a guy who wrote a lot of hymns. He was amazing. He wrote some 6,500 hymns. You probably have uh, sung some of his hymns before. Uh, two very popular ones at Christmas are Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, and uh, Come Thou Long, Expected Jesus. And then there's a real popular one that we sing at Easter, uh, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. And he was somebody that was uh, not only the brother of John, but he founded something called the Holy Club. It was a group of folks that got together and they met every morning at 6 a.m. to pray for three hours. Can you imagine getting up before school and praying from 6 to 9 a.m., three hours every day? Uh, they were so holy in the way that they did things, their friends made fun of them and they said that they're so methodical in their faith that they nicknamed them the Methodists. And that's why we're called Methodists today. Uh, it was actually a, a slur at first, but we take it as a, a term of honor that we're so methodical in our faith in the way that we sing, in the way that we pray, the way that we go about our life of discipleship. One of the songs that Charles Wesley wrote was, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. But let's hear now as our bishop, Bishop Peggy Johnson, plays that song. <laughs> To sing the praise of God. In verse 4, Charles Wesley writes, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. He sets the prisoner free. We are prisoners to our sin until Christ comes along and pays the price for our sin. He breaks the bonds of that enslavement to sin and allows us to be free, free in the grace that Jesus Christ gives us. What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be free in Christ? We're going to talk a lot about that today. I've invited a lot of friends on our cabinet, people that are leaders in our annual conference, to share from Scripture about what it means to be free. And if you think about freedom, we think about freedom here in our country, in the United States of America. There was a price to be paid for that freedom when we think about how this country was formed and the American Revolution and all that went on right here in Delaware on the eastern shore of Maryland. We had leaders like Francis Asbury, who we consider to be one of our first bishops in the United Methodist Church, and how he spent the time in the American Revolution. 
You see, the Methodists weren't really a denomination at that time. They were a part of the Church of England. The Methodists were a reform movement within the Church of England, which meant that they considered their head to be uh, the king of England. Uh, so when those folks were here in the colonies, in the American colonies, they worshipped in what we consider now to be the Episcopalian Church or the Anglican Church. But when the American Revolution broke out, all of the ministers, all of the Methodist ministers, because they were loyal to the crown, they went back to England. They left the colonies and went back to England. Uh, Francis Asbury was one of two people that actually stayed here in the colonies. And he spent the American Revolution kind of hiding out in the swamps right here in the state of Delaware. Uh, Methodists were thought to be Tories or people that were loyal to the crown because they were part of the Anglican Church. But actually, Francis Asbury didn't choose sides. He was somebody that uh, went and organized on both sides. He was somebody that was a part of the movement and, and ministered to both sides. John Wesley was somebody that was a part of that movement. He's considered to be our founder. Uh, he preached against slavery and what it meant to be free and how slaves should be free. And he took it upon himself after the American Revolution was over and realized that the colonies were now their own country, what we consider to be the United States of America, that they could no longer have a church that was the Anglican Church or the Church of England. So he wanted to care for the Methodists that were here in the colonies. So he did something that was really radical that his brother Charles gave him a hard time for. But he ordained two people. He ordained Thomas Coke and Richard Watco and sent them to uh, America. And they came to this place right here in Delaware. We're here in Barrett's Chapel right now. Take a look around this beautiful place. But at the moment that uh, Coke came to Barrett's Chapel, Francis Asbury was preaching right here in this very pulpit that I'm standing behind right now. And Thomas Coke came in the door right over here. And when he came in, Francis Asbury was so excited to see him that he stopped in the middle of his sermon and he came down, came down here and he embraced Thomas Coke right here. And there's a star right here commemorating this. This happened in November of 1784, and it was here in this place, the star marks it, this chapel was built in 1780. It is the oldest standing building that was ever built for and by Methodists. And it was here in this place that the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion were first Accept it first given out to the people as Methodists right here in this place, Barrett's Chapel, right here in the bounds of our annual conference, the Peninsula Delaware Annual Conference. 
And a month later, those leaders went to Baltimore at Lovely Lane Chapel, and they organized the denomination, what would be called the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. The Methodist Episcopal Church, they organized it on Christmas Day in 1784. They knew a little bit about freedom, and they knew that now that they were free as a new country, that they were going to do something new with their Christian faith. Another way that we think about freedom, we ask, how were the slaves in our country, how did they experience freedom? One of the great Methodists, a person that, that grew up hearing sermons in the Methodist church in Bucktown, just outside of Cambridge, Maryland, uh, on what is considered to be the Eastern District of our annual conference, was somebody by the name of Harriet Tubman. Uh, Moses, if you will, she was nicknamed part of the Great Underground Railroad. And she helped many slaves escape their enslavement and took them to freedom in the northern states. It's important that we recognize that she was someone who learned from Methodist teachings. And she understood that freedom was something that was tangible. That she had to help people break away from their enslavement, uh, from their owners, their plantation owners or the farmers that were enslaving them, and take them into freedom. One of the great Methodists that we have in terms of uh, hymns is Charles Albert Tinley. He was born outside of Berlin, Maryland, on the Salisbury District. And he wrote a song called Stand By Me. Let's listen as our bishop plays this song. <laughs> Stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When my life is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rollest wind and water, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. Listen to the words of that particular song. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can and my friends don't understand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. I know that's an old hymn, and maybe you don't sing it in your particular church, but I bet you can relate. I bet there are times when your friends misunderstand you. I bet there are times when you think that the world is crashing in all around you, when you've, you've read things on social media or somebody's saying something about you or you're just misunderstood or you just can't get things right in school. The freedom in Christ allows us to feel the presence of God with us all the time. Even when things are, feel like they're crashing all around us, the hymn writer Charles Albert Tinley tells us that we can think about God's presence and God being with us. Charles Albert Tinley was born uh, to a father who was a slave and his mother was free. Uh, he was somebody that, that uh, had many hymns, that wrote many hymns, including one called I'll Overcome Someday. I'll Overcome Someday, the text of that particular hymn became uh, used in a song during the Civil Rights Movement called uh, We Shall Overcome. We Shall Overcome as those marchers in the Civil Rights Movement were marching for freedom from Jim Crow laws all throughout this country. They used those words from Charles Albert Tinley to express their desire for freedom in song. Now, Charles Albert Tinley was a preacher right here in what we call the Old Delaware Conference, which was a, a separated conference at that time just for African Americans and, and their churches. And with that, there wasn't freedom. There wasn't freedom. We weren't completely together. But during that time, uh, Charles Albert Tinley served in the bounds of our annual conference. He served a church in South Wilmington, Delaware. He served in Odessa, Delaware. He served down in Pocomoke, Maryland, and Fairmount, Maryland. He was even the, 
the pastor at in Wilmington at Ezion Methodist Church, which now we consider we call Ezion Mount Carmel. In 1900, he became the Wilmington District Superintendent, and what those days was called the presiding elder of the Wilmington District. And at, after that, he became the pastor of a church in downtown Philadelphia, where when he uh, left the shore, he went up to Philadelphia, and he worked at a church where he was a janitor at the church. He later became the senior pastor, and that church grew so much that they renamed the church after him. It's one of the uh, precious churches in our uh, United Methodism, and we call it Tinley Temple, where he was the pastor. Think about that freedom. Think about the freedom that he expressed in song and the freedom that we need. Are you free to do everything you want to do? Are you, are you free to pick the football team that you want to uh, support? Maybe some of you are Ravens fans. Maybe some of you are Eagles fans. Maybe some of you root for the team in Washington. Uh, maybe you're Orioles fans or, or Nationals fans or, or Pirates fans. You're free to choose. Uh, you're free to choose where you want to go to church. Uh, you're free to, to choose a lot of things. And do you have the freedom of speech in our country? Ultimately, true freedom, whether it's freedoms that we have in our country or freedoms that we have in our church, true freedom comes from Christ. And we have a lot of folks that can share with us from scriptures what it means to truly be free in Christ. Let's listen to them now. Exodus 2.11 says, one day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, and so their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Imagine how Moses would have felt when his own people, Hebrews, were forced to do hard labor and beaten right before his eyes by Egyptians. He was witnessing to people's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual agonies under the Egyptian slavery. It may be difficult for us to feel what it is like to be slaves now in our modern days. Starving and being forced to work to death came as normal for them. Perhaps through your history classes, you may know that Japanese invaded Korea in early 20th century. Koreans were severely oppressed. They lost their Korean names since Japanese forced them to take Japanese names. They took the properties Koreans owned. They even conscripted young boys to send to the battlefields to fight and young girls to comfort Japanese soldiers at battlefields. They got forcefully separated by their families. Many couldn't come back home, but died at battlefields. Can you imagine such could happen to you and me? Your name would be taken away, your house taken by the government forcefully. No freedom at all. The Bible says that Moses grew up to be able to see all these sufferings that Egyptian oppressions brought to his own people. He grew in his longing for the freedom from the Egyptian slavery for his own people. Later in the biblical narrative, we find Moses addressing this evil and being called by God to set Hebrews free by confronting the Pharaoh, the Egyptian ruler. Though he felt inadequate for God's call, he started to follow God who led him to emancipate Hebrews. God heard their cries and sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh. In our modern times, what is it like to see and name slavery or bondages that make people suffer physically, mentally, and spiritually? What about children who suffer from abuse and exploitation? 
Moses had a longing to set his own people free from the agony of slavery. Such growing desire led him to seek God. Even though he gave some excuses to God when God wanted to use him as a leader to set Hebrews free, he obeyed God's command in the end. His growing desire for freedom must have led Moses to pray and seek God's help. Through your life, there may be a time when you feel like you need freedom from something addictive, say, to games or drugs. Pray and seek God's help. Seek help from God's people around you. You may see people suffering from all kinds of oppressions like Moses did. Pray for them and seek God's help and help from pastors and good Christian leaders for their sake. Remember that you as disciples of Jesus Christ are the freedom writers or freedom agents God is going to use. Let me remind you of a charge from Jesus who read in the synagogue the scroll handed to him from the prophet Isaiah as in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor. Let us remember this anointing, this blessing from the Spirit of the Lord to proclaim freedom for those in bondage. Amen. Hello, I'm Reverend Joseph Archie. I'm the Wilmington District Superintendent. And I want to say welcome to all of you confirmands. And I want to share with you a word from the book of Ruth. Ruth is a book in the Old Testament. It's a dramatic story of loss, of love, of leaving an area and then returning back to the same area under different circumstances. It's a story about redemption. It's about a woman whose fate was in peril and then she's saved by a gracious and loving kinsman redeemer. So what is a kinsman redeemer? A kinsman redeemer is someone in the Old Testament who is a relative who can buy someone back if they've been sold into slavery. The kinsman redeemer can also buy back land that has left the family. In the Old Testament, God had set up that every family would have a certain amount of land and they'd keep that land throughout each generation amongst the Jewish people. If that land was sold through hardship or if it was in escrow because of death, the kinsman redeemer was able to buy it back for the family. Naomi had lost her husband. Ruth is Naomi's daughter-in-law. She also lost her husband, and Ruth had gone into the field of a man named Boaz. She went there to pick up leftover crops to eat. The field belonged to her distant relative. Boaz was her distant relative who had been very nice to her. While Boaz is sleeping, she uncovers his bed sheets and sleeps at his feet. What she is saying in effect is, I want you to cover me with your skirt. I want you to put your wing over me. That's a way of saying I want you to marry me and be my kinsman redeemer. You've got to remember that Ruth is a Moabitess. That means she's a foreigner and a widow in days when there was no social security and widowed women were extremely vulnerable. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate, the town of Bethlehem, same town that King David and Jesus were born in. And when the king's rede kinsman redeemer to Ruth, the one closer to them, closer to Boaz, came along, Boaz said to him, to the one closer to Naomi, Naomi has come back from Moab. 
You know about it. She's selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of all who are seated here. If you want to redeem it, do it. But if not, tell me so that I will know. I'm next in line and the closest kinsman redeemer to Naomi. I will buy it. I will redeem it. By this time, though, Boaz had come to love Ruth. Boaz tells the nearer kinsman, you're going to be buying land from someone who is not of Jewish or Hebrew heritage, but one from Moab. You will then acquire the land, but also the dead man's widow, Ruth. This time, the closest kinsman redeemer said he could not do it. He said, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to buy the land because I don't want Ruth as my wife. So the kinsman redeemer says to Boaz, buy it yourself. Boaz was overjoyed as he announced to the elders in the courthouse, you are witnesses that I have brought from Naomi all the property of her husband from her two sons. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite. She will become my wife. I can maintain the name of Naomi's husband, the name of Ruth's dead husband, and we will pass on the land to our children. So they got married. They had a child named Obed, who became father of Jesse, who then became father of David, who became the greatest king in Israel's history. So Ruth becomes the so many greats grandmother of Jesus. And this story has important parallels to Jesus's ministry. Some of the important points about a kinsman redeemer are this. A kinsman redeemer is someone who is a blood relative. Ruth says to Boaz, you are the closest relative. You can marry me and give me protection. Think about Jesus within our own lives. The Apostle Paul says of Jesus that Christ was made of a woman, born of the Virgin Mary. Mary. Galatians 4, made under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Talking about the Jewish people being redeemed by God himself through God's son, Jesus. Paul also says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus Christ, who was in the likeness of men, being found in the fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient even unto death on a cross. That provides the redemption for all of humankind. Jesus, our eldest brother, the one who took on flesh, who became one of us, redeemed all of us through his blood. The second aspect of a kinsman redeemer is that they have to possess the necessary resources in order to pay the price. In chapter three, Naomi says to Ruth, don't worry, Ruth, Boaz has the resources. He'll take care of it. Likewise, Jesus has the resources. He paid for the redemption of our sin once and for all with his sinless nature and death on Calvary's cross. First Corinthians says that we were bought with a price, the price of death of Jesus on the cross. The kinsman redeemer also had to be willing to pay the price, not only having the resources, but to be willing. The closest redeemer to Naomi and Ruth at first said, yes, I want the land, give me the land. But when he heard about having to take Ruth to be his wife, he changed his mind. But Jesus says to us in John chapter 10, I willingly lay down my life for the sheep and I lay it down freely. So the kinsman redeemer must be willing to take not just the land, but Ruth as his bride. Boaz is willing to take the foreign woman. Note that the Jewish people and the Moabite people have been at odds for many years. Now think about how we, those of us who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, are at odds with God. But back to the story, Moab, Boaz says, I will take her in, just as God and his son Jesus loves us and wants to take us in. Boaz, the symbol of the kinsman redeemer and model of the great kinsman redeemer, Jesus, the one paying for our sin, that which we ourselves cannot pay. There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. 
For all of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. Our sin keeps us spiritually dead. Yet it is by the grace of God that we are made alive. By the grace of God that we are offered abundant life in the here and now and eternal life in the days to come. Thank God for our ultimate kinsman redeemer, who is Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. I don't know about you, but I find a lot to be afraid of in today's world. Am I going to get COVID? And if I get it, am I going to be really sick? Am I going to die from it? Am I going to be able to get the COVID vaccine? And if I do get it, is it going to work? Am I ever going to see my mom again? Am I ever going to see my friends again and be able to have life as we once had it? I don't know about you, but I, I could use a hug right now. Life is really scary. And following God's plan for our lives can be just as scary. Sometimes God asks us to do things that seem bigger than we are things that we really don't want to do, things that seem impossible to do, things that just scare the bejesus right out of us. Often fear can lead us to do things like give up on our dreams. We give up on our dreams because we think maybe we can't do it, or maybe people are going to reject us, or maybe we're going to make a bad decision that's going to ruin our whole entire life. And so, so we don't do anything. We don't let people see who we really are. We don't try to do things we've never done before or try to step out of our comfort zone and, and try to reach for the stars and the moon. Fear can cripple us. It can stop us dead in our tracks. It can control everything that we do and say. And maybe we don't, we don't know how to, to deal with our fear. Maybe we don't know what to do with it. But please know this, fear is not from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear. God will never ask us to do anything that is bigger than we are or that is impossible for us to do or that will harm us or put us in harm's way. That is not God. God does not give us a spirit of fear. And so we get to decide. We get to decide how we're going to live our lives. We get to decide whether we're going to live our lives with a spirit of fear or we get to decide if we're going to live our lives with the spirit of God. Are we going to let fear lead us or are we going to let God lead us? I encourage you today to let God lead you. God created you. God gave you all the gifts that you have and God has a big plan for your lives, bigger than you could even know. And so follow God. Live boldly. Live fearlessly. Don't let your fear keep you from doing what God has called you to do or from or being who God has called you to be. After all, you really have nothing to fear but fear itself. Eternal and all wise God, the giver of all good gifts, we thank you for all that you've done and you're doing. And God, we ask now that you move by your spirit and your might. Let your glory be manifested now. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Galatians, the fourth chapter, verse 21 through the fifth chapter, verse one. And the thought for today is free in Christ. Charles Albert Tinley, uh, the great hemologist, he was uh, born in Berlin, Maryland. His father was a slave, but his mother was born free. And even though Tinley himself was considered free, he grew up amongst individuals who were considered to be slaves. Charles Albert Tinley, the one who wrote that song, The Storm is Passing Over. You'll understand it better by and by. Stand by me. Understood uh, the struggles of living in a time where some were free and some were enslaved. We find in the text the contrast uh, between Ishmael and Isaac is seen first of all as a contrast between bondage and freedom. And, and when we are born uh, in this world, we are born in bondage to corruption of this world. And when we are born again, it is into liberty and freedom. 
Secondly, it's a contrast between the flesh and the promise. In the fulfillment of the promise, Jesus comes into the world to set us free. The Jews argued that they had been in bondage to no man. Perhaps forgetting both their history and their current situation, Jesus demonstrated to them that a fleshly descendant from Abraham was not sufficient. Thirdly, it is in contrast between the old covenant and the new. Hagar, the Egyptian, is likened unto Mount Sinai in Arabia, where the law had, was given to Moses. This is the apt, because the Arabians are known as the sons of Hagar. In a, in a master stroke, Paul then has Sinai to stand for Jerusalem, hence the Jews and all their inheritance of Jerusalem. Together they are brought into bondage by the very law which God used to lead them to Christ. And by contrast, Christians are citizens of the heavenly uh, uh, kingdom. Uh, citizens, I say, not slaves. It is evident by the use of the Mother analogy in the text that Jerusalem is standing there in a place for Sarah, the free woman. And then should we wish to return into slavery to law, which has not redeemed us. The Bible in the, the 27th chapter of the text, uh, the same verbiage is written in Isaiah 54 and 1, which has primarily written with a prophetic view from those who exile from Babylon. I come to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that God is a God that will set you free. And when you're free in God, when you're free in the spirit, the Lord will make a way somehow. The Bible declares, then, brethren, we are not children of bondwomen, but of the free. And let us enter into the inheritance which God has laid up for us. Uh, we must understand when we're free, we'll be able to uh, do what God has us to do. Songwriter said it like this, praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting and it's just another blessing. Praise the Lord, I'm free. Can I say that again? Uh, I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just another blessing. Praise the Lord, I'm free. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you until we meet again. Greetings, everyone. I kind of enjoy it and honor to be able to come and share this word. Our word comes to you from John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. And you'll find words like these. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to share for a little while from the subject, freedom from sin. Beloved, it has been said, one of the most quoted statements in the Bible is the truth shall make you free. Surely all of us know that the Declaration of Independence has been and continues to be the model for freedom around the world. The American dream is for the most part about the principle of freedom. America was founded for freedom, but despite this principle, it was at the March on Washington in 1963 that one Odetta Holmes performed an old Negro spiritual entitled, O Freedom, a song sung by the newly freed slaves after the Civil War. 
She sang, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. However, it is only Jesus who offers real freedom to every person. It is when we abide in the word of God that we receive the prescription for freedom. And one must first accept the truth. And one of the reasons humanity became enslaved was their rejection to follow the one true God. It is here in verse 34 that Jesus is talking about how sin causes one to be a slave of sin. The Jews asked questions in verse 33 about how they can be made free. These Jews felt because they were Abraham's descendants, they had never been in bondage to anyone. They felt that their pedigree put them above others. But we can only be set free when we've experienced the truth, when we admit our enslavement to sin. We must understand that freedom comes through a person. Uh, Galatians 5, 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, it is the Son, my beloved, who make you and I free, and we shall be free indeed. No matter how many freedoms our nations give us, it cannot give us the freedom from the shame and guilt imposed upon us by our sins. It is only when we accept Jesus Christ by belief, then repentance, confession, and baptism, that we will be free from the guilt and shame of our sins and released from the penalty of sin. Please know that when we offer ourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, we are in turn slaves to the one we obey. But thanks be to God that though we used to be slaves to sin, by obeying the teachings of Jesus, we have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. We are free from the power and penalty of sin. We have been made right with God by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, our justification. God has freed us from the burden, from the punishment of our sin. We have the freedom to enjoy a relationship with God that was once denied to us because of our sin. Is Galatians 5, 13 to 15 reminds us, for we have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. For the whole law can be summed up in one this one command, love your neighbors as yourself. Our freedom, beloveds, was not cheap. We have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are free to be filled with the spirit which brings freedom and not bondage. We are free to live without condemnation of the past or fear of the future. It is then and only then can we truly sing, I am free. Praise the Lord, I am free. No longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, I'm free. That, my friends, is when we really have freedom from sin. God's truth shall make us free. God bless you. The scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. And it reads as thus. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up and read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we think on these things, open our hearts and our minds to hear you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us all imagine Jesus, who has returned home, is sitting in his place of worship, not with strangers, but among people who knew him and his family. This time he is at the front facing the congregation. So scripture tells us that he stood up, was given the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and then read the words of the prophet Isaiah. He started with the words, the spirit of the Lord is on me. In other words, he was telling people who he is. And he repeated one word three times, proclaim. He was anointed. He received a special calling from God to proclaim good news, sent to proclaim freedom and to proclaim the Lord's favor. This was Jesus' mission and it was his purpose. So for just a few minutes, I would like to talk about what freedom meant to Jesus and to us. You know, because of our sinful nature and the weakness of our flesh, we are all in, we were all enslaved or in captivity of things of this world. And God knew we could not release ourselves. He knew we couldn't pardon ourselves. He knew we even could not even be free from time served. And today and even in 2021, there are just some things right now and even in this year that we need to be free from. Addiction, whether it's drugs or cigarettes, bullying, racism, disrespectfulness. Talking about and making fun of people is just to name a few things that can mess us up and cause us to make mistakes that can harm us and someone else. And God knew that we all are capable of experiencing something that will capture us. You see, things of this world are so tempting. It looks good and it makes us feel good. But God knew that everything that looks good is not good for us. And can cause us to separate from him. So he had to send Jesus into this world. So that he could fix us. And especially the wrong in our hearts. When back to the scripture of Luke. In verse 18. Jesus is telling us that he had come to proclaim freedom. But this freedom is not just to be released from prison sales. Or giving us permission to do what we want to do. Or do what makes us feel good. This freedom is different. It is to free us to do the right thing and become the children of God that he created us to be. Also, to let us know this freedom is not just for some people. It's for anybody who wants it. God loves us so much that he sent his only son to show us the way for all of us to be free. And this is the highest price that anyone has ever paid or will ever pay for our salvation, our freedom. Therefore, it is so important to read and to hear God's words, to hang out with other Christians, to pray and ask for prayer. And remember that God's love is for all of us, for everybody. And we should treat everybody as a child of God. Jesus loves each one of us. And we have to keep that little light of Jesus that is within us shining so that the world will know that we are proclaiming our freedom because of Jesus. You know, a hymn writer wrote, I am free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound and no more chains holding me. Because of Jesus, who was, uh, who was anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. We are no longer bound. We have no more chains holding us. Remember. God loves us, and with God in your life, you can always have someone to lean on and always be free. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we pray for this generation of our young men and women of today. Shine your truth into their hearts. May they hear you in music, see you in art, and experience you through the love and care of family, friends, and teachers. Build your hope into their lives. Sow your wisdom into their minds. Weave your love into their dreams so that this new generation will know you. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Bill Westbrook and I'm the conference treasurer. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the commitment that you'll make to the United Methodist Church when you're asked to join your congregation. One of the things that in, when you're taken into the church, it says 
Will you faithfully participate in the ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? I want to briefly discuss what it means by your gifts. There's actually two gifts that you provide. The first is talent, the talent that God has given you, and the second is your treasure. As the finance uh, director of the annual conference, I'm keenly aware of what the finance means. And as a connectional church, what we try to do is fulfill uh, John Wesley's commitment to the world as my parish. And we do that through something we call the apportionment. There are several general church apportionments that are provided at the general church level, one of which is the World Service, which provides all of the funding that provide ministry and ministry, ministry and mission throughout the world. It provides for hospitals, it provides for education, provides for orphanages, provides water supplies all over the world. And you can do that by participating in the apportionment. There's also apportionments for the African University, Black College Fund, the General Administration Fund, which provides for the General Conference every four years, and the Episcopal Fund, which provides for our bishops throughout the world. Then locally, we have what we call the, the Healthy Church Initiatives Budget, which is our conference budget, and it's broken into three different components. One is our programmatic side that does all of the ministry within the bounds of our annual conference, the administrative side, which provides all of the benefits, the pension and health care for our pastors. And the third is uh, clergy support, which provides uh, minimum salary support and also uh, the support of our district offices and our district superintendent. And all of that together makes us the United Methodist Church. So I want to encourage you to provide your gifts to your local church, both in talents and treasure. And God bless you. Hi, Confirmands. That concludes our uh, virtual confirmation rally. I'm here at the museum portion of Barrett's Chapel, and I'm right next to a portrait of Bishop Levi Scott. We have three bishops elected that served here in the bounds of our annual conference. Bishop Scott uh, was in the 1800s, and he was born outside of Odessa, Delaware. Uh, Bishop Felton May, who served as Eastern District Superintendent, he was also uh, the first executive director of the Methodist Action Program in Wilmington and served as our conference council director. Uh, he was elected a bishop and also Bishop Sanders Steiner Ball who was born and raised in Milford uh, and served as our Dover District Superintendent and also our uh, Connectional Ministry, the Director of Connectional Ministry. Uh, we're so proud of those folks that have gone on to serve the larger church and hopefully as we give honor to your pastor and your youth leaders and your confirmation teachers, uh, maybe you might be able to come here to Barrett's Chapel to explore the museum and explore the grounds. But ultimately, we know that as we learned about freedom today, particularly from Scripture, we learned about what it means to be free from slavery, about what it means to have a kinsman redeemer, what it means to be free in the life of Christ, what it means to be free from sin, and then be able to proclaim that freedom to those friends and family around us. Uh, as you become a member of your United Methodist Church, we praise God for you, and we thank God that you will have God walking with you all the days of your life as you experience that freedom, freedom in Christ. Thank you, and God bless.